Okay, today is, two, is Thursday, April 7th, 2011. This is the start of an interview with Mr. Mr. James Edward Dallas at the RSVP offices of Catholic Services of Macomb, located at 26238 Ryan Road, Warren, Michigan. Mr. Dallas is 64 years of age, born November 14, 1946. Mr. Dallas currently resides at 15240 Windermer, Southgate, Michigan. 48195. My name is James Buckley. I will be the interviewer, and Gary McGiglio will be the videographer. <clears throat> Mr. Dallas, would you please state for the record the branch of service you served in? United States Army. Okay. Um, if you would kind of uh, just walk us through a little bit about your childhood, where you were you know, born, raised, and siblings, and maybe a little school activities type of thing before entering the service? I was born in Detroit uh, and we lived in Detroit for a couple of years. Uh, my parents were both born and raised in Detroit. We moved to Lincoln Park. We moved to Wyandotte when I was in the fourth grade. And I lived there until with my wife. Uh, we were married in Wyandotte. We lived there uh, until uh, our first child and then we moved to Southgate in about 1970, that era, 72 or so, and we've been there ever since. And I went to high school at Our Lady of Mount Carmel in Wyandotte. Uh, that's where I met my wife. And we have two children, a uh, son, uh, James Jr. He's 40 years old now, and my daughter is 37. My son uh, is married, living in Wyandotte, and he has a, a, a daughter who is uh, 16 months now. Uh, she was a miracle baby, born premature, spent the first seven months of her life in the hospital. My daughter has uh, three children now. The oldest one is three, a uh, daughter, and twins, a uh, boy and a girl, that are uh, uh, 18 months old. And um, okay, so uh, so you have a, a nice little family. Mm -hmm. Let's um, let's just go back to you know you, you went through high school and uh, play any sports or anything like that. Uh, I, I played uh, varsity baseball and uh, hockey for the city of Wyandotte at the time during high school. I played grade school football yeah. and uh, and basketball and baseball and everything. So we. Uh, my siblings and I were quite active in, in uh, sports. I have uh, uh, two brothers and two sisters, and I am the second oldest. And uh, then uh, the three younger uh, children uh, are basically 12 to 14 years younger than I am. So it was like a different family yeah. uh, growing up. What, what year did you graduate from school, high school? 1964. Okay. So then, before you entered the service, you must have worked or yes. went to school one or two? Yes, uh, I was going to night school at Henry Ford and I was working at Ford Tractor. Uh, my father was employed at Ford Tractor as a manager and uh, I uh, was employed through him there, but I was also, before that, working for as a local delivery boy for uh, a local a food market uh, in our town of Wyandotte. So I did that for a while. And then, then I was drafted in uh, January of 1966 on my dad's birthday, uh, the uh, 10th of January of 1966. Okay, and then uh Excuse me, after, after you were drafted, uh, you, of course we had to report to BASIC and that was where? Uh, BASIC was in uh, Fort Hood, Texas. Okay. And I also spent uh, my uh, advanced uh, infantry training there, AIT, at Fort Hood. BASIC training was quite a, a shock because uh, everybody thought that Texas was the hottest place on the planet. And in January it would have been very nice, but we had uh, two feet of snow, and the pictures I sent home from uh, basic training, uh, I was wearing Arctic weather gear. It was just quite uh, 
unbelievable, extremely cold. And then uh, after eight weeks of that, you go home on leave for a month, you come back, you go through eight more weeks of uh, advanced infantry training, and it's hotter than blazes. The snow had melted, so it's really <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, but uh, from, uh, and the basic training was uh, surprising uh, to me, was the barracks were brand new, brick buildings, uh, and we shared a room with a, with a squad of maybe seven, six people at the time, and, uh, and the facilities were A1. Uh, and then uh, advanced infantry training was also the same. Uh, and then when we finished uh, AIT, uh, we moved to Fort Riley, Kansas. And Fort Riley, Kansas was the home of the Big Red One. And the 9th Infantry Division uh, was formed in 1966 by General Lewis Marlin who had served with the 9th Infantry Division in World War II. And so it started back uh, just for the Vietnam War as a uh, uh, division that would primarily be sent to the Mekong Delta as there was no presence uh, in the Mekong Delta of Armed Forces of the United States. But at any rate, the uh, facilities at uh, Fort Riley, Kansas were uh, completely opposite of what they were at Fort Hood. Uh, these uh, were original World War II barracks, and it was really, uh, the latrines were L-shaped open latrines. Uh, everybody shared a, a toilet together, and uh, it was uh, uh, it was harsh, I guess you could say, but uh, we were training as a unit, and there was a lot of, uh, a lot of camaraderie, I think, because we trained as a total division, and not as uh, like a replacement, uh, you know, unit or something. So so your fellow uh, soldiers were a lot of them from uh, the Texas uh, Advanced Infantry Training group yes. as well. Yes, yes. Uh, in, uh, in Texas, we were part of the uh, the artillery, and then we moved into Fort Riley. We became part of the infantry, Ninth Infantry. And uh, while I was in basic training, I was uh, uh, given uh, the stripes of a of a buck sergeant, and. Uh, and I continued on into uh, Fort Riley, and I was promoted uh, on the boat over to Vietnam as full-time uh, Sergeant E-5. And uh, many of the uh, individuals that I went in uh, were promoted at the same time uh, as Sergeant E-5s. And so I had a squad of, uh, of uh, individuals in the Fort Deuce Mortar Platoon. And we also had 81 millimeter mortars there too. I uh, also was uh, a forward observer uh, in the army and uh, in Vietnam, and that was quite an experience. Well, it seemed like you advanced quickly. Is that because of uh, some you know prior experience, or do you, do you know why that might have happened? Well, just I, I, just, I think it was just pride that my my uh, parents uh, raised me. Uh, I think in the best possible way. Um, I'm a Roman Catholic, and we were given a Catholic education, and uh, and taught the uh, you know the basics of right and wrong, and, and being uh, responsible people, and proud of where you came from. And I can remember uh, one particular instance in basic training. We were going through the bit where we crawl under barbed wire, under live fire. Oh yeah. And everybody goes through basic training, goes through that. But I remember. Uh, a lieutenant uh, was standing there and he kicked my rifle, and he kicked my rifle out of my hands. Well, nonetheless, I became incensed at that, I suspect, uh, that pride took over. So I just uh, ran up to him and, and I pushed him and grabbed my rifle back. And that's uh, the next day they gave me the three stripes. And uh, so, um, thinking that it would come out the worst that I pushed an officer, uh, it uh, it came out came fine. out fine, right? Yeah. Well, that's a great story. Yeah. Different outcome than what yeah. it could have been. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then at, at that point you were in Vietnam, and um, we arrived in Vietnam. Uh, uh, I spent basically 22 days on a boat, and I, <laughs> to 
tell you the truth, I enjoyed it. I never got seasick once. I enjoyed eating other people's chow. But it was like a perpetual chow line that you were in because there was 5,000 plus uh, GIs on the boat. And, uh, and we left, uh, we left uh, under the Golden Gate Bridge on a, on a nice, uh, you know, uh, sun uh, like evening at dusk. And uh, it was just a pretty sight. And uh, and so I, I basically was uh, was enthusiastic about being in the service at that time because I was drafted. And I should step back. I was drafted uh, at a time when all my buddies were being drafted, all friends that I used to hang around with, and I was like the last to go of the group. And so uh, we all went, and, uh, and uh, I, I, I met up with a few of them. Uh, in Vietnam, some of them didn't come back, and uh, but we were all in different units, and uh, so um, going on the bus to basic training from uh, Detroit uh, first to Fort Knox before going to Fort Hood was probably one of the loneliest days of my life. It was dark, and, and uh, I think everybody on that bus was very homesick, mm -hmm. and uh, and and uh, then we. Going back to Vietnam, um, you know, you, you start to adjust to that. But still, you know, you're further away, thousands of miles from home. And I remember landing on a beach at Gong Tao in uh, southern Vietnam. And we came out as a unit. The band was playing, and our general, uh, General Eckhart, uh, was leading the troops out of the big uh, landing craft. Uh, and uh, it was quite uh, patriotic, quite emotional. And uh, so then we soon loaded on deuce and a half, uh, the favorite army truck of the uh, uh, of World War II since right. then. And, uh, and then the shots began to be fired at <laughs> us. So, uh, so it was a rousing welcome, I guess you could say. But uh, you know, the, the homesickness uh, started to set in again, especially when you're uh, you're there for a holiday, like Christmas, you know, spending Christmas away. It was kind of uh, not fun. Well, you you were then, I guess, corresponding with the girl that became your wife later in yes. life? Yes. And so forth, because you said you met her in high school? Yes. You were a, a, pretty much a couple during that time? Yes, yes. So that would be difficult as well. Oh, sure, yeah. And uh, But, you know, I, uh, I felt... Uh, I really felt for my parents uh, a lot because of the situation I was in. I can remember being at home and watching TV with my dad and my mom and my brothers uh, and sisters and, and watching the war on TV uh, as brought to you by uh, you know, Chet Huntley and David Brinkley, the like of them, and Walter Cronkite. And you say, I never expected I'd be there, but by all the time came, I went. And, uh, and so uh, it was quite a quite an awakening. But uh, and so you know, I wrote. I wasn't really what you call a uh, prolific writer of letters home, much to their dismay. But I worried about them uh, uh, more so than I worried about myself at the time. Um, that I worried about how they would grieve for a lost son, and uh, and I didn't want that to happen. Well, at that time, there was still uh, uh, quite a bit of support for the, the the conflict, you know, in the in the United States versus later on when there was a lot of the rebel, you know, mm -hmm. groups that were out there trying to uh, against the war. And so, yes, yes. So, what, where did you where did you stay then uh, when you got to Vietnam? Did they have um, you know, permanent type facilities, or were you in tents, or what type of a well, situation? When we, when we left Phong Tau, we went uh, uh, through Saigon and uh, did some further processing through Saigon. Then we loaded on uh, 11th Armored Cavalry tanks, and uh, we drove uh, through the jungle, <laughs> knocking down uh, you know the jungle and creating our own roads, uh, basically. Uh, to an area about 40 miles south 
uh, west of uh, Saigon, and it was a base that was named by General Westmoreland as, as Dong Tan, and it means, I think, unified in spirit. And he wanted to have a name that people could easily remember back home. And so there was nothing but a rice paddy when we got there, and the CVs were just coming in, and we were living on tents, and we were, uh, uh, you know, we would go out and patrol the area uh, and uh, set up deployment uh, at the berms at night uh, and uh, guard the building of the base. We were the security. And uh, we, uh, it was pretty different. I mean, it was uh, muddy, rainy, but we actually went over there, uh, you know, before the wet season, it was still the dry season, but still, nonetheless, there was some rain and there was mud, and uh, and plenty of it because you had the river, uh, and you had the sea bees operating, uh, dredging out the rice paddies and bringing in sand and filling it up, up the base, and the base soon built up uh, to where you had permanent barracks. Um, outside of the uh, the human civilization, there there was plenty of rats that uh, that uh, populated the the whole base, and uh, we used to have rat patrols at night. We'd, we'd, we'd uh, fill up 50 gallon gallons of uh, 50 gallon drums of, of water and, and baited it, and then the rats would. Uh, in the morning, we'd see uh, a lot of drafts that were <laughs> met their demise in the water. But I can remember writing a letter to my parents, my mother especially, and I'm writing a letter, and we. We had uh, our cots were on a dirt floor at the time, and uh, and we had some pallets or ammo boxes that were set up as uh, a partial flooring, and uh, and I remember writing a letter to my mother saying, and then there's a, I can hear the rats right now, you know, <laughs> probably about five feet away, <laughs> and uh, mother like that, I'm sure. Yeah, and then I can remember being out in the, out in the uh, field. We'd go out in the field maybe at four or five times at a day at a time and come back in to rest. And uh, uh, and this was early on. And I can remember in a dry rice paddy, in a dry season, you'd set your poncho liner out and you'd be up against a little dike. And the dike might be two feet tall by two feet across. And the mud, uh, the, the, the paddy itself would be very hard you know, during a dry season. It was like a puzzle. A corrugated puzzle, and the uh, the rats and mice would scurry through the the cracks in the rice paddy, and, and then they would live in the uh, in the dikes, and you would feel a bump here and there, a bump there. <laughs> it was kind of, you know, it was really uh, odd. And then you'd go into a village, and you'd see, uh, uh, a, a, you know, just a village where people would come in and to bring their their produce, and you'd see a young man with uh, a bundle of rats by the tail, some live, some dead, some pack rats, some right rats, I mean rice rats, some you know just you know just huge. And they would bring them into the uh, to the uh, village square and then they would, you know, uh, sell them for food. You know? and, uh, and it was quite uh, so rats were big rats were a delicacy, you know, to the Vietnamese there and uh, and uh, I just didn't care to eat them. Right. Um, yeah, that would be a real acquired taste. Mm -hmm. So then, um, after they, they built the permanent barracks and so on, and did you then um, leave and go out into the, the like the wilderness area, so to speak, you mm -hmm. know, and at first, forward, uh, forward? At first, uh, you know, I had the squadron, a uh, squad of, uh, uh, seven guys that uh, uh, that uh, ran a four deuce gun, and uh, it's a it's a mortar, and uh, it's the largest mortar that, that the army had, and we also had several uh, 81 millimeter smaller mortars, and so at first we uh, we were mostly in camp for the first month or so, and then we uh, became attached to the uh, Navy's riverine force. Actually, we became part of uh, of a joint riverine uh, force with the uh, Navy, uh, and uh, what that entailed was that we uh, loaded our guns on barges, and uh, and uh, and we would.
would float down the Mekong River or in through the canals that uh, ran into the Mekong, and uh, we would provide fire support uh, for uh, the ground uh, infantry troops. And uh, we, uh, some of the troops lived on uh, a big uh, a barracks ship that the Navy had, and uh, and it was pretty. Uh, Pretty interesting in that they had uh, armored troop carriers, uh, you know, uh, boats and uh, gunboats and supply boats, all moored up against uh, a huge wharf that was attached to this big uh, troop ship. And uh, I never lived on the ship, but uh, at about that time, uh, I went out uh, uh, with the infantry. Uh, well, we were the infantry. I went out with uh, the different uh, companies within our division as a forward observer. And uh, again, we would go out maybe uh, uh, three, four, five days and then come back in for a uh, relaxation period, trying to dry off and, and everything. We went through the, some of the most harshest uh, uh, terrain uh, that you could go through. and. Uh, uh, so as a uh, as a forward observer, I had a radio uh, operator uh, that was with me, and I was responsible for calling in in direct fire uh, in support of of our uh, operations, and uh, and I can remember you know we would uh, we would ford streams in the middle of the night, uh, and uh, the water's up to your neck and it's rushing. And, uh, and sometimes we'd use a rope, sometimes we didn't, and uh, uh, things get wet. I mean, especially you, and then you're marching, or you're you're uh, you know uh, training through the, the rice paddies and the wood lines, uh, you know, early early morning, and you're dead tired, and it comes like four o'clock in the morning. You finally pitch camp, for instance, and you deploy uh, your Fire base, basically, you know, on the perimeter, mm -hmm. and uh, and then uh, nobody dared smoke, and uh, and so I would have to go out, for instance, uh, at times, uh, and uh, serve as like a, a watchman, where I make sure that these guys weren't sleeping on on the perimeter, and uh, so that was very interesting. And we meet village villagers. We go into a village and. Uh, and we'd uh, give out candy, and uh, we'd uh, um, trade sea rations for Vietnamese food. And we had a captain, CO, who was Hawaiian, and we'd often, you know, cook over the uh, open fire and uh, and make uh, uh, sort of a mixture of uh, sea rations, Hawaiian, and Vietnamese food. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we. Uh, Oftentimes, uh, you know, I'd have to call in fire, you know, into a, a wood line, and uh, not knowing what's there. And um, were the Viet Vietnamese uh, receptive of you being there? I mean, did they know that you were like their friends, so to speak, or did, were they skeptical? Of, the the of Vietnamese. You as well? That's a good question. The Vietnamese were skeptical, especially in the Delta, not, not having had uh, an armed U.S. force in there uh, previously uh, until basically um, the uh, end of 66 when the 9th Division you know, landed in there. And, uh, and so one of the ideas behind the Riverine Force was to try and minimize the, the, uh, the uh, coming in contact with the Vietnamese as much as possible by being on the water. But, you know, you get off the water and you've got to land. Uh, you, you come off the water and, and then you land on a, it could be a beach, it could be just a mangrove swamp, you had to fight your way through. And, uh, and you, then you'd be coming in contact with uh, the population, more or less. But, you know, I can remember, you know, uh, you know, specifically certain days and times where we uh, came under fire, uh, landing on a, you know, uh, 
narrow canals and, and uh, the Navy uh, would be manning the, uh, the troop carriers. And uh, we got off the beach at this one time and, uh, and it wasn't much of a beach. And landmines uh, were there. And you see somebody jump, blow up in front of you. It's, uh, it's uh, not a pretty sight. And uh, we had uh, a number of casualties there on the beachhead. And a medic uh, went to, uh, to help the first person that was blown up. And he got blown up. And I can remember our lieutenant colonel uh, coming uh, behind, tapping us on the helmets to keep going forward. And uh, we went forward, and we uh, and he, we were under fire, and uh, the uh, and we started getting suppressing fire uh, to clear the beachhead, and uh, and uh, then we cleared it, and we uh, uh, tended to our bodies. And uh, and we started putting uh, parts in, in poncho liners and uh, carrying them back. And uh, um, and it was uh, it was the most uh, I think uh, I've been scared, but uh, uh, the uh, the heroism by that lieutenant colonel. I mean, he came down off his bubble chopper and and landed. You know, uh, you know a little ways away and he ran out of that chopper to us and he just, you know, got us moving and got us firing. And I had been assigned to a, a to a, uh, to a battalion that day that I wasn't familiar with. And, uh, and that particular company, B Company, uh, had their Ford observer was killed uh, and that's why I was assigned to them. He was killed the last mission they went on. And uh, so we, uh, the day-long operation that we had uh, was really uh, eventful. There was a lot of uh, a lot of uh, contact, and uh, and we had a, a, a group in one company, not ours, uh, that was ambushed, and uh, I think we might have lost about 79 people, and uh, and we uh, we came upon a scene of that uh, the ambush and. Uh, none of our bodies were there. They were all um, gone by the time. But spent shells, uh, busted up M60s were there. And just uh, uh, in front of them, uh, there was about 50 dead via column. And in, in every manner of shape and form. And uh, uh, it was the most, you know, horrific thing that I had seen. And uh, and uh, and we, we just kept on going and uh, uh, and then I think the division was really they made a mistake by being too far out in the open uh, in the uh, rice paddies and without having scouts on either side the flank or out in front to, to really uh, check for uh, enemy movement they call them scout out that's a term that would be used to have and uh, scouts on the flank they could be, they could be, you know, 50 meters to 100 meters on your flank, and then out in front they could be, you know, 500 meters out in front. But they, they failed to do that, and uh, so they got caught out in the open. And uh, but uh, after that, all hell broke loose. The armored personnel carriers came out and uh, um, engaged with uh, the enemy. 50 caliber mounted guns on the armored personnel carriers. Gunships coming in. Uh, we had uh, uh, Navy jets were coming in off the carriers of the China Sea, and uh, and one of the uh, uh, one of the guys I was with, uh, uh, he got killed, and uh, his head was just it was awful. But. Uh, uh, the Navy pilot uh, was hit by enemy fire, and uh, we watched him as he ejected. And there was a big plume of smoke uh, you know, uh, on the other side of a tree line that could be like, you know, 600 uh, meters away. You could see it, and, uh, and uh, we 
was just a, a you know a frightful day. And the details aren't always clear, but uh, you know I should think back. You know we you know we uh, continued on. Uh, the armored personnel carriers pushed uh, the Viet Cong into uh, an area that tall elephant grass, and then we became the group that I became became the blocking force or the anvil in which they were pushing uh, the Viet Cong into. And the grass was, you know, as high, I can remember it was the high as the ceiling, I would say. And uh, we were all in this in position, and we couldn't see but grass in front of us. And, uh, and then they, the Viet Cong were pushed into us, and then the fire started, and bullets came whizzing by, and, uh, and then we started firing. But, you know, we had M16s, and we had M79 grenade launchers, and, uh, and uh, but you know, an M16 around will hit a could hit a leaf and it could deflect. You know, and so we didn't know how much damage we did. Oh, but uh, but afterwards we uh, we uh, we realized that there was quite a bit of damage left, and and, and, uh, and so we counted uh, you know bodies after that, and uh, we we came out of the we came out of the grass, and then came out of the open area, and uh, and geez, there was helicopters, M MPCs, APCs, uh, and there were bodies all over, and uh, and so uh, and I to tell you the truth, I don't know how much in terms of body count it was because you know not until you learn afterwards when you get out the body counts were were exaggerated, but. Uh, they were just they were just all over the place, and uh, so so uh, um, I'm glad I wasn't part of the detail. I had to count the bodies or to take personal effects away, but uh, uh, you know of the enemy and of our people. But uh, so we kept on going on that. Uh, we were still pursuing uh, the enemy, and you know, and uh, and we kept on going through the night. And you know, crossing streams and everything, and then uh, finally uh, uh, we were told that uh, you know we were going to uh, form an LZ, a landing zone for a pickup, and uh, we we were picked up uh, you know uh, early in the morning, uh, you know just after dawn, and uh, we went back to uh, to base camp at dawn camp. How, about how far was this landing zone from your base camp? I mean, you know, your your travels were they like a, a ten mile stretch or yeah. twenty five or yeah, ten to twenty five, I'd say. And uh, and uh, and then I mean, the, when you went out on these missions, I mean, the, the helicopters would come in and pick you up at dawn time, and there could be you know, money, you know, waves of them, just waves of them, and uh, it was the most exciting thing to. To see them come in, and then you're part of the takeoff. It's just the most exciting, exhilarating thing to a young person. And uh, it's just uh, they take off and they go like this, and then all of a sudden they take up and go up. And uh, you're traveling 150 miles an hour like this, and then all of a sudden you're going up, and you know, 2,000, 3,000 feet, and then you swoop back down again, like a big roller coaster, and you're coming in, and uh, and. Some of the elements uh, are going somewhere else uh, from others, uh, different LZs, and you land, and then you, uh, you clear the LZ, you land in tall grass, not as tall as the grass I described before, but wavy grass nonetheless, you know, two, three feet high, and uh, you're, you're jumping out of the chopper at five feet, and, and you're, uh, you know, you're clearing the LZ, and then you say goodbye to the choppers, and you're out there on your own. And uh, well, you were about what, 21 or so? I was 20. Time? 20. I was 20 at the time, and uh, um, and uh, I remember getting, I got hurt. I wasn't wounded, but uh, I got hurt on a, one of the naval missions or the Marine Force missions uh, because we went, we would go from a riverine to helicopter. We would float down the rivers. We would go on a helicopter, and I remember on the riverine. Uh, deployment, I I tripped on the grate that went down, you know, the landing craft like the Higgins boats from World War II. The front of the boat uh, 
it drops down and you charge off. And uh, I remember tripping, uh, and the, the, the grates were like this. And I banged my knee, and my knee swelled up that night, and they had to, uh, we had to get a chopper to fly me out. And uh, I was flown to, a, uh, to the naval ship, uh, the big troop carrier. They had helipads, and uh, they took me to see the doctor, and I remember them uh, giving me a shot to drain my knee, and the needle was like this, and uh, and two two orderlies or so were holding me on either side, and uh, and uh, he took that needle and he just went like this, he went like this, and he sucked things out, and then uh, he said, "Now you're gonna hate me, uh, Sergeant Dallas, for the next week." I could have kissed them because the next day I felt like 100% better, and but they they flew me back to to the you know um, to the field where I was, and uh, we continued on. So there was a lot of um, inner cooperation then between like the Army and Navy oh, and it's, uh, at that time. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, it was quite a bit. Quite a bit, and the whole concept of the Riverine Force was taken from the uh, French. The French had it before us. Uh, and they weren't anywhere near as well organized, and the Vietnamese uh, were part of that too. But uh, the organization that uh, that the Army and the Navy had during my time was uh, was phenomenal in terms of the the logistical support uh, and the firepower, and uh, and it was uh, it was really uh, you know quite a an awesome thing to see. But. Um, um, you know, and I talk about things being awesome, and I talk about horrific things, uh, and uh, you know, there's, there's instances where you become scared to death, scared to death, literally scared of your life. And uh, but I can remember in fits of rage, um, you taking fire uh, across a little small stream, and you, you can't see, you couldn't see the enemy, and uh, jungle as thick as can be, and. Uh, you uh, and your gun jams, and I remember standing behind. A tree. I was just swearing, you know, to holy hell, you know, that I was so mad, and I was actually losing control because I was so mad because I, my gun jammed, and it was shortly after that that we never filled our our uh, cartridges with you know up 20 rounds. We put 18 in there, and uh, I hoped it wouldn't jam. And I mean, you became really expert at uh, field stripping your your weapon. Uh, too, uh, but uh, uh, then I started carrying a Thompson submachine gun, and uh, then I got from a, we were going out with Vietnamese guys too, and uh, and uh, the Thompson machine gun's a 45 caliber, and it's a pretty heavy weapon, and it uh, it uh, is pretty powerful, but not at long distance, and uh, and that was. Uh, I shot a water buffalo, and uh, and the, the water buffaloes are basically peaceful creatures. But uh, we were told that sometimes they will charge our unit, and if they're not familiar with you know uh, other humans that they're not used to being around, they will get very upset, and uh, so the males around their cows would be you know apt to charge, and uh, and so I shot this water buffalo with the 45. I'm sorry, with the M16, and uh, and it went down, but then it was clearly suffering, and uh, so I grabbed the 45, the Thompson from the Vietnamese guy, who was now clearly agitated because I had shot a revered animal, and so I I just trudged forward and uh, and uh, left the, the you know the, the line that we were in walking, and uh, and I. I put a couple of bursts in its head with 45, and uh, and it put it out of its misery. And I, you know, I can remember the guy beating on my back, <laughs> angry with me, and uh, and uh, you know, ready to rip my map up. And uh, I was apologizing, and I I didn't know. I was young, and I was told to do what I did, you know. And someone yelled out, the lieutenant yelled out. Who shot that water buffalo? And I said, I did. He said, Great shots, ours and gals. That's all I remember. And it was just, uh, you know, just one of those things, I guess. But uh, yeah, that's that, that's the problem you have with the different customs and yes, beliefs yes. of uh, oh, and the, the different 
folks that were there. And in that poignant moments that I have in slides too, uh, where you know you 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 you're, you're walking along, you're 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 in formation, and then you're outside of a village, and then you see six Vietnamese dressed in white and black pants carrying a coffin, and a red or orange colored coffin uh, on their shoulders, uh, and their heads are down. I mean, they, uh, that was uh, the saddest thing, one of the saddest things you'll see. And, uh, and to think it might have been because of us, I don't know. And then another poignant moment is that you're on an, ar ar an armored personnel carrier, an APC. And the wet paddock, the, the, the paddocks are flooded, and uh, and you get called uh, away to another area uh, to meet up with another unit. And the commander gives the you know the order to just cut across the rice paddies. And you can see an older, an elderly gentleman. He might have been 40 years old. Uh, elderly he was 40 years old at the time for the Vietnamese. And two young sons pulling the plow and he's holding the plow and we're cutting across his rice paddy and we're like destroying it and he's shaking his fist like this and I just felt I was so upset with us doing that and uh, um, and I you know it's you know I had ethics I had morals and uh, and I just didn't like those kind of things and I can remember the time that I uh, recall to you uh, about being hit on the beach, you know, after the beach was cleared, members of the unit that I was attached to wanted to beat the crap out of certain villagers, and I stepped in, and I was so upset with with uh, with the soldiers for wanting to do that, and uh, so you know, I pulled rank on a lot of guys for wanting to do that, and uh, well, you had a lot of responsibility for a 20-year-old. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it's quite an ordeal, I'm sure. You brought a lot of uh, mementos uh, today. Why don't you share a few of those with us while we have a little bit of time? Well, uh, like your map and some, maybe some, yeah, this, some photos uh, or what have you. This is uh, one of my most prized positions here. It's uh, the Combat Infantry Men's Badge, CIB. And uh, it's only given to uh, soldiers who serve in combat in the Army. And, uh, and I'm very proud of that. And uh, this is an Army Commendation Medal for meritorious service uh, in support of military operations. Uh, this is my extra rifle badge. It was for the M14. Uh, and I qualified for that in uh, basic training, even though we issued M16s uh, before we went overseas. This is my, my division patch for the 9th Infantry Division. And uh, these are my campaign ribbons, uh, Vietnam campaign ribbons, and uh, this is a map that I use as a Ford Reserver, um, and it uh, <coughs> and maps uh, were very um, um, very much wanted by the Viet Cong uh, in North Vietnamese. Uh, because it could have your true movements on it. Well, what we had was we had uh, uh, plastic overlays on it, and so that we would draw, uh, you know, with erasable uh, mm -hmm. markers. On point, it. point out the area that where you were doing that. Uh, this area right here uh, was uh, was the rice paddy that was dug out to make the base camp, uh, Dong Tam. It was also called Whiskey Base. And uh, um, I'm not entirely sure why we had that, but we were uh, also called the Whiskey Rebels. And uh, but at any rate, uh, they dredged this area out here, and uh, and this the town called Mito was an old French town, and uh, a lot of French architecture, and it was off base to to us, but. I snuck in there a couple of times with my lieutenant and a driver and my platoon sergeant uh, to have a, a night out of town. And uh, we even went to a movie there uh, with our weapons loaded. 
but uh, we got invited to a meal by the mayor of the town, and uh, and he was having rat. <laughs> so, so we didn't have any of it, but uh, we had a good time nonetheless. And then uh, it's about eight kilometers away from uh, from where our base was. And uh, this island right across uh, is an island that uh, was uh, infiltrated by the Viet Cong. Had a lot of Viet Cong in the island. And uh, through the night, uh, you know, you'd see uh, gunships, uh, A-130. A C-130 gunships uh, that were operated by the Air Force, and uh, and they had uh, uh, 20 millimeter cannons and 50 caliber uh, weapons that would be firing uh, tracers uh, into that island, uh, and in in anywhere around the base, you know, uh, where we would often come under uh, a mortar uh, fire, and. Uh, and then you'd see a, a gunship go up there, um, and just almost unbelievable to it'd make a big spur noise of just spitting out those rounds and uh, and doing a lot of devastation, I'm sure. But this island here, uh, we had to go out in this island. I went out with the recon platoon on a number of, uh, a number of occasions. We would be uh, dropped into a you know an LZ. At uh, maybe just at dark, and then uh, and then we'd be picked up like the next day, and uh, so we were <clears throat> we went out uh, in a uh, in a in a like a Higgins boat uh, one night, and uh, we were our mission was to capture a, a, a village chief, and uh, we we weren't able to get all the way into shore. And we had to drop, uh, you know, the front of the, the, the grate in front of the boat, and so we had to wade in uh, to shore, and that was up to my neck. And I can remember holding my weapon up, and I can remember we were, you know, there wasn't a big Vietnam or Viet Cong unit, I don't think, on the island at the time, but we were taking fire, and I can remember bullets whizzing down. I went underwater, my helmet was up top, and I could still feel the whizzing uh, going by my head. And it was just weird. Uh, you know, you, you couldn't see the shots being fired. But we got on to uh, we got on to the. Uh, it wasn't even a beach. It was just a clearing. And we got on and we started uh, just to, you know, the the M60s were uh, laying down fire. And uh, I don't think there was a whole lot of fire being going on at the time. But we walked, you know, uh, many miles that night, and uh, uh, and we would take sporadic fire. And uh, and you know, then we would start laying down suppressing fire, uh, and, but you never saw them. You never saw the enemy. And uh, were, were they just villagers, or were, was it the actual uh, they army? Or? I think they would be uh, uh, the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong, uh, you know, they would threaten villagers uh, with their lives if they didn't, you know, uh, come over to their side. And uh, there's a lot of atrocities on both sides, but. Uh, but the Viet Cong would, would, would commit atrocities like, like that uh, to, uh, to discourage people from cooperating with us. And I, uh, I captured a couple of, uh, I captured a couple of young uh, uh, Viet Cong uh, that uh, they were hiding underneath one of the uh, buildings. And uh, and uh, we had, you know, completely surrounded the building. We must have had, I don't know, 25, uh, you know, uh, 25 of us in the unit at that night. And uh, and so uh, these two were uh, hiding underneath uh, uh, a hooch, a building. And, uh, and uh, they basically gave up. You know, they uh, they basically dropped their weapons. Now, I don't understand why, but uh, I'll never understand it. But they both were wearing scapulars, and uh, they were Roman Catholic, I would suspect. And uh, um, and I felt like, you know, this is uh, something. I uh, I blindfolded them, and uh, and then I turned them over to the Vietnamese the guy who was with us, and uh, they. They came out with us, 
Uh, we left that night and we went back on our, we rendezvoused with the, uh, with the, uh, with the boat, and uh, I never saw them afterwards. I don't know that they were, and then you read about things after the war, about what they did with prisoners, and uh, like dropping them out of helicopters. I don't know. I never witnessed that myself, and I hate to think that these two would lost, uh, met their demise that way. And I, you know. I often think of that um, as much as I think about the guys I've seen, you know, in my unit uh, get killed. Um, so, because uh, they were just, they were just young like I was. But, uh, so. How long were you in the, that area then? Is that where it, you, you stayed for the remainder of your, well, yeah, your, was, your stay? This whole base was our base of operation. Okay. And, so at about, uh, with about three months to go on my time, I came back into, I came out of the field as a Ford Observer. And uh, we uh, uh, lost our section sergeant, uh, which was, uh, uh, he had uh, command over four crews, four the, uh, uh, four deuce crews, the mortar crews. So I took over his job. And, uh, and it was like plush living compared to what I've been used to. And so I had my own tent. Uh, I had, uh, I befriended a little puppy and, uh, and uh, he was at my side all the time then after that. And so I was uh, relatively safe in the base camp area then, um, except for like motor fire and whatnot. And so I had, I had 28 uh, men under my command at the time. And uh, so it was, uh, it was pretty good duty then. So and how long did you end up uh, serving in that area then, in total? I, I put a year in. Uh, we were, our tours of duty were a year at the okay. time. And uh, so I left, uh, I had gone over there on a boat, took me 22 days, and then I left uh, on a plane out of uh, Benoit uh, Air Base took me 22 hours <laughs> and uh, and uh, I can remember on the way over we stopped in Okinawa and on the way back we stopped in Guam and uh, we we uh, we landed in San Francisco uh, on the way back and uh, immediately uh, they asked me if he wanted to re-up actually they asked me before I left you know and uh, talked about the bonus and everything and I made instant promotion I said no I, I said I'm going back I'm going back to college full-time and, uh, and uh, you know, several of the guys in my, you know, that I got to know were, were college graduates. And, uh, and we became good friends. And so uh, I uh, came back, processed out of Oakland, uh, uh, and uh, went back to San Francisco airport and took a taxi there. And they gave us new dress uniforms. And I spent the night there uh, sleeping on the floor. And uh, I remember calling my brother and telling him, you know, I'm coming home, but I want it to be a surprise to mom and dad. You know? And uh, so, this is stupid, but uh, I, uh, so I got on a plane, we took the uh, uh, red eye uh, out of there about, uh, I think about 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning. And uh, I had been there for, you know, you know eight, eight or nine hours. And, uh, and there was only like a, handful of people on the plane and uh, I remember they passed out free drinks to us and uh, <laughs> I mean you could smoke on a plane then you know <laughs> and uh, uh, but uh, so we get into Detroit and it's uh, just before Thanksgiving and uh, I take a cab uh, home uh, and uh, it's, it's about 10 miles from the airport and uh, and so I remember the cab pulls up to our house on 14th Street and wind up, and uh, my brother couldn't, you know, go without telling my parents. So immediately the whole family rushes out. You got my mom, my dad, my dad was leading the way, my brother, and my three uh, baby brothers and sisters, you know. And, uh, and they all rushed out, and they all hugged me, and my dad was crying, and I was crying, and it just it was the most uh, tearful reunion. Was just a, a real, a wonderful thing, 
And my mom told me that my dad, every night, every night, uh, my dad had the whole family lined up, uh, you know, along their bed, praying uh, the rosary for me. And it's just, it's just a terrible, it was just a really a, a tough, you know, thing to understand. Yeah, but, uh, it was just, uh, just a wonderful thing, and I think back that, uh, that uh, I'm glad I didn't lose my life for them. You know. Did you um, keep in touch with any of those uh, buddies you had uh, during, during, the, during that time, uh, 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 after the war and so forth? Yeah, one of them uh, that uh, he, uh, it's funny, he was one of my good friends and, and uh, in the high school, he went to another high school, but we played ball together. And uh, he got killed uh, one night. We were out drinking at a bar in Wyandotte, and he got killed in an automobile accident. The strangest thing. And then uh, um, another friend uh, went to another high school too. Uh, he lost both of his legs, and, uh, and uh, we we sort of dropped. We corresponded for a couple of years, um, and then. Uh, uh, a kid from Melvindale, who was uh, my primary gunner in our uh, section, uh, he was just a, a year younger than I was, Andy Payne. And uh, Andy and I, uh, you know, uh, we're very close. And uh, and uh, now he's moved away to uh, uh, one of the Keys in uh, Florida. And uh, the clear blue sky about uh, two years ago, we hadn't seen each other in like, you know, in so many years, but we we had uh, talked to each other and uh, we're sitting in a big boy restaurant and uh, in comes this guy he sits down in a booth next to us right over the side from me and I went I said, oh my god I looked at Evelyn I, my wife and I said oh my god that's Andy Payne Andy yeah Jim Dallas oh my god <laughs> we came around we started hugging each other you know we hadn't seen each other in so long and uh, and he was, I mean, we were in the service. We were just this tight, you know. And uh, and uh, there's a picture of here, with, uh, him and I. I learned to smoke in the army. And, uh, and uh, it, uh, that, uh, that's that's him without the shirt. Oh, okay. And uh, did Gary get a shot of that? And here we are. He's uh, we're cleaning a base plate uh, for the Fort Deuce mortar. We were in a, a, a barge at the time, and uh, Touch it down a little bit. That's good. Yeah, that's good. And uh, I'm getting the gun plates. A big base plate when the Fort Deuce mortar goes off. Uh, it really it's, it's it's a 105 inch base plate, and it's like 4.2 inches, you know, across. And it's a pretty powerful weapon, mm -hmm. uh, as is the 81 millimeters, going smaller. But uh, I have, uh, you know, uh, a picture like this. Uh, it's pretty typical. Um, that's my radio operator in front of me. I'm taking a picture. We're heading back to the, uh, the boats for pickup. And uh, you know. Tilt. No, you're not the lower, just tilt it a little bit, get the glare off. There you go. And uh, I can remember, uh, you know that time I told you about, we took fire on the beach and uh, yes. yeah, young guys were exploding in front of you. We got, we came back to, uh, uh, to that area later on that day and the, the boat that brought us in, completely almost destroyed the, the, the tower on the boat, uh, the driver was killed, they, the Navy lost about, I don't know, nine guys I think they lost that day, and that was our boat, wow. it took rocket fire, and, uh, but uh, they, they had come back for us, and, uh, and they're, you know, they, all they have is like, a, I think it's like a two-man, three-man crew and a, a 50 caliber on it, and uh, they came back to wait for us. And, uh, and you go down these canals, there's, they're narrow canals, some are wide, but most of them are narrow, and, and they're all over the delta, just unbelievable myriad of, you know, canals. And, you know, you're, you have to take fire from, from the mangrove uh, swamps on either side, it's just unbelievable, it's a scary thing. Nonetheless, it was the most beautiful country that you could ever see. 
and uh, and, uh, and some of the pictures I took, I took through an aiming site that uh, you know the telescop telescopic range on it, and uh, just beautiful, just a beautiful wood line, and it's just a beautiful country. What what is this, Jim? This was a a, a sign I took off a tree, uh, and uh, and I really don't know the words too well here, but it. It, it's telling you there's a booby trap here, and it was put up by, it had to be put up like an Arvin, uh, the Army of Republic of Vietnam uh, soldier to let us know that there was a booby trap there. Is that on the other side? side on the other something? sign, you'll see the famous oh, Pabst Blue Ribbon. Beer cans. Made out of beer cans. <laughs> yes, sir. And I'll tell you, it was. Uh, the beer that we drank mostly over there uh, was uh, uh, from Manila, San Miguel, the brewery in San Miguel, and that's where I took my R&R &R and visited the brewery. But uh, and that beer, they would bring the beer in, unload it on deuce and a half into Donk Town, and, he, and they would just go by every unit and they dump it off the back, and psh, 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 cans exploding, you know, and it's like, oh, that's cool, and uh, and then. I can remember in the village where the kid came down uh, to the village square with his rats, there was an open little open cafe made out of ammo boxes that they had collected. And we were sitting there at one table and they brought out a glass of beer. It was froze. They poured it, it as warm as can be, but they poured it in a glass with ice. And uh, you wondered where the ice came from, you know, but uh, and you wondered if it was tepid or what. Yeah. Uh, because uh, they would eat stuff out of the canals along the dikes that, you know, they did everything in, but uh, yeah, Stroh's and Pabst. <laughs> and it was most memorable. These are, these are my dog tags I still have. And uh, believe it or not, I still have a wallet that I, uh, in the other box, I still have the wallet that I, uh, that I uh, carried throughout. But we interacted with uh, with uh, with uh, children a lot in the village, and here we are, you know, uh, having some sea rations, and uh, and then uh, children. Uh, always wanted chocolate from us mm -hmm. or anything. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. universal the world over, isn't it? it sure is. And uh, and then this was. Uh, Something I wouldn't recommend again. Let them play with their uh -huh. arms. Yeah, we had a we had a, in this very uh, same day uh, we had a guy in our platoon that uh, set the Claymore mines we had set out. He set the Claymore mines to face us, and uh, he later <laughs> uh, we didn't have proof, but he later. Uh, uh, booby trapped a uh, latrine in Bates Camp, and uh, and I'm sighting in the guns, with the mortars, and with the, all four squads, and uh, I see him walking, you know, walking to the. I see a couple of guys come out of the latrine. <coughs> it's a wooden latrine, and uh, and then you, they got holes in them, right, in, in uh, the pots are underneath. Mm -hmm. And then I see uh, he walks out of it, and all of a sudden, a grenade goes off inside. And it blows off half of the uh, latrine, and uh, so I immediately went over there with uh, grabbed a couple of guys and we detained him. And then uh, the result of that thing was that he uh, he was a little loose cannon in the head, and uh, he admitted to setting those claymores, uh, reversing the claymores on it. <coughs> and we uh, we uh, had a court martial in Saigon. Uh, and uh, so we were flown, uh, myself as a witness, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, the lieutenant and the first sergeant and the uh, uh, sergeant major, we were flown into uh, Saigon and we had a court martial and the guy's now in Fort Leavenworth, I think. <coughs> oh my gosh. At any rate. Well, anyway, uh, it's quite a, quite a set of experiences that you had uh, during your active duty. Uh, afterwards, did you join any of the uh, military organizations uh, here back in the 
the states, you know? Not immediately. Or not immediately. I, I, I went back to uh, full time to college. And on the campus at Eastern, uh, I commuted, you know, and I didn't. Uh, I didn't want to tell anybody that I was, uh, you know, a, a veteran there because there was, you know, at that time there was more right. of uh, the uh, protests going on, and so I sort of kept myself on that. And I even, uh, even when I, uh, during later years of employment, uh, you would get people talking about the Vietnam War in a, in a, you know, in a way that was uh, insulting to us. But nonetheless, it was their opinion, and I always, uh, you know, respected people's opinion. But I, you know, I know guys were spit on. Uh, I, I was never spit on, but I, the, with the invectitude that came out of some of the mouths of people I worked with at times, you know, uh, that uh, was uh, was really uh, not a good thing. But you know, you, you, then you begin to read more uh, about the war, the history of the war, and you begin to question some of the values that you had going into the war. And like the like the exaggerated body counts, and uh, and it, it, that's dismaying to me, uh, you know, and uh, also dismaying to some of the atrocities that have happened. Uh, but uh, um, and that's the and that's the uh, horrific part of a war, you know. I just uh, you know, what troops go through today would be no different than what we went through in terms of experiencing the horrors of war. Exactly. But I I later became a member of the. Vietnam Veterans of America and the, and the American Legion, uh, uh, and uh, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not active, you know. Since I, uh, I get the papers, I donate every year. I marched in the parade once, and that was a, 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 a really, a, it was a tearful thing, you know, marching in a parade afterwards, on the Fourth of July parade. My parents were quite proud at the time, but uh, so uh, I, uh, you know. All the buddies I hang around with now that uh, we go off together, they are all veterans. And uh, one is a Korean War veteran, and uh, one is a Vietnam veteran. Two of us are. And one is an Army veteran. Uh, so, uh, but uh, we don't talk about the war. I don't. I don't spend a lot of time talking about the war. And I was never bitter afterwards about what the Army uh, did to me. Uh, and uh, uh, and so. Uh, you know, I know people who are very bitter, and I, I didn't like to hang out at uh, at uh, BFW's or American Legion House for that reason. Yeah. Well, we really uh, appreciate you coming in today, and certainly want, again want to thank you for your service to the to our country. And uh, it's uh, great uh, having this chat. Yeah. Well, anyway, I didn't take too much of your time. No, <laughs> that's that's perfect. And in fact, well. Great timing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're about the end of our video tape. Okay. 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 Finish. Yeah. So, That's about you. it. We're, we're <coughs> about at the end, weren't we? Good. Good. We have a minute or two left, I think. Yeah, you know, time. I used to work with this guy here. I, used to, I worked for him. That's what he said. <laughs> Best years of my life. Well, he didn't say that. Another the lady that's a sketch lady told me. You know, <laughs> did I learn to drink beer from you? Put it. Oh, yeah, turn this down.